to the fall meeting. Let me just click this. Uh, welcome to the fall meeting of the Federal Bench Bar Committee. We originally were going to use the jury assembly room for folks who wanted to attend in person, but Nora told me that's not the best room to do a hybrid Zoom and in person, so we opted for all Zoom. And based upon the survey results that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, I think everyone's good with that. So um, just going down the agenda, the first um, item is the district conference debrief. And I have to say, I really was looking forward to attending. An emergency came up that day. I couldn't make it, but I heard terrific feedback. So I'm looking forward to the debrief. And I think, John Xavier, are you on? Hi, thank you. Yes, um, I am. Oh. Would you like to do a little debrief? <laughs> you guys did a great job, I hear. Thank you. Yes. Um, Thank you all for those of you who came and supported the event. Um, I think it was a tremendous day, tremendous insight from experts from across the country. Uh, thank you to the court for all of the amazing work that was performed uh, by so many people. Uh, Nora, uh, Raina, Frank, uh, Jennifer Diaz, and, and thank you to Judge McConnell for all of your support each step of the way. Um, I, I will say that the conference was recorded on video. So uh, if you did attend and perhaps you might have missed something uh, or would like to check out the conference again, uh, the video recordings are on the court's YouTube channel. And for those of you who couldn't join us, uh, I would encourage you to check out those videos as well. Um, but I, I would like to hear if anyone has any feedback uh, or remarks about the conference. I'll just chime in real quick and say, you know, I've been going to conferences like this for, for 15 years and I helped put on the 2019 conference plan, some of that, which I thought came out really well. But the one this year, I think this was the best conference I went to. Um, so it's congratulations you know, to everyone that helped put it together. The, the panelists were amazing. Um, everyone was really engaged in all the rooms that I went to. Um, and it was just a really inspiring and a great, you know, great day. Um, so again, I'm just completely blown away by by how much work went into this and just how great every single thing was at the conference. So, you know, great job to everyone involved. Thanks, Michael. I'd like to see a part two on qualified immunity myself. I thought that, I mean, you know, it was scheduled for when it was scheduled. It felt to me like it ended way too soon. And I could have happily sat there for, you know, into the evening listening to that discussion and, and to those people. Good to know. Thank you, Barbara. Any other comments? If you if you are um, looking for video CLE credits, you have to watch um, all the segments and then you have to email me with your bar number and let me know that you have watched it so that I can forward you a CLE for that. So it's separate from being in person. Thanks, Raina. I'm actually, I'm glad to hear it's actually. the videotape. That's great. I'm sorry, say again, Pat. No, I was saying thank you for that. And I'm glad to hear it was a videotape. That's terrific. Yes. And it is just six credits because you only can get six video um, CLEs per quarter, I guess, or per year. Okay, any other questions or comments on the district conference? And Nora, I know we've attached the um, District Court Conference Committee presents the inaugural Olin W. Thompson uh, Justice Award, Award to Bob Mann. Um, I don't know if there's anyone who wants to comment on the presentation. I know Judge Smith is not here, but maybe Judge McConnell might um, just do a brief recap. Oh, that would be great. Well, yeah, just simply the court decided um, when we um, the travesty of losing Olin Thompson couldn't uh, had to be recognized, um, and um, the spirit of Olin carried on in some fashion and perpetuity. And 
So we um, collectively decided, actually Judge Smith's idea um, that we established the Olin W. Thompson III Justice Award to be given out um, at every district conference. And because it goes to attorneys actively participating, we also decided to turn it over to the district conference committee to choose the recipient. Um, and they, um, they chose uh, well uh, they, in choosing Bob Mann, who I can't think of another living person who embodies um, so much of what Olin um, meant to all of us. Uh, he, um, Krista, his wife, his three boys, um, Nat, um, Atticus, and Olin the fourth uh, were present and quite moved by um, the remembrance of, of him. So it, it was a, a great award named after a great person and given to a wonderful person. And um, yeah. Thank you, Judge. It's a, a fitting tribute on all fronts. Yeah, we, we miss him a lot. Okay, next on the agenda is the Litigation Academy. There's another session in December. And I think Brooks McGratton, are you on? Yes, I'm here, Pat. Thank you. You know, uh, we the Litigation Academy ran a program last May on uh, courtroom advocacy. And when we opened it for registration, the program uh, sold out within a day. Uh, there were a lot of folks who wanted to attend who couldn't. So we're repeating the program on December 20 and 21. Um, this is really designed for younger attorneys uh, or attorneys who uh, may be new to the litigation experience. Uh, it involves a, a, a case problem that raises personal jurisdiction issues. It was a case that actually Judge Stern decided and that was affirmed in Rhode Island Supreme Court. So uh, students will see a videotape lecture by uh, Judge Sullivan on courtroom advocacy. They'll see a demonstration by Steve Richard and Stacy Nikazian uh, on how to do it. Uh, they appear in court to argue in front of a judge, uh, an experienced attorney, and a professional actor, and, and they will receive feedback uh, and then on the last day, there's an ethics lecture and a panel discussion by our judges about um, courtroom advocacy. So terrific program. Registration is open. I think there at this point, there's just two or three slots left. Um, so we expect this to sell out soon. And um, we want to thank the court and the, the federal bar community for supporting the Litigation Academy the way you have for the last several years. Well, thanks, Brooke, it's, and thanks for your leadership. It's a terrific program. Pat, can I just mention something that didn't make the agenda because we just decided um, to do this yesterday? <laughs> um, but I wanted to mention that we, we always have a reception after the Litigation Academy, and it will be on December 21st. It's a Wednesday at 4.30. But we would like to open that up to the entire bar. So there had been talk in the past of ha having former Litigation Academy students come and kind of mingle with the newer ones. But this year, and for the last couple of years, actually, we've, we've wanted to do like a holiday gathering mm -hmm. um, for the members of the bar. And so we thought it would be a good idea to combine those two events and have a holiday gathering, just a, a cocktail hour from 4.30 to 6 or so, right in the, in the foyer of the courthouse and so we invite everyone to attend um, to stop by and have a cocktail and so hopefully people can make it and we'll put out an announcement and invite obviously but I wanted to mention anchor first no yeah, sounds good to me no that's great <laughs> um, next on the agenda are the results of the bar survey and I'm going to turn it over to Frank Perry uh, thanks so much Pat um, so I had uh, dropped the survey results in the uh, agenda that circulated and just dropped it in the chat as well. If you recall, this was a survey that went out to the bar uh, several months ago, really to kind of get some good feedback, you know, from you on, on the continued use of Zoom. You know, obviously, you know, since the uh, start of the pandemic, you know, we've been, you know, using Zoom regularly. Um, and as, um, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the virus sort of get, got under control a bit. We're, you know, slowly making our way back in the courtroom um, for hearings. However, you know, we really wanted to kind of gauge, um, you know, from the bar, um, you know, how they feel about really the continued use um, of Zoom. So that's really, you know, really what the survey was about. So firstly, thank you very much, 
you know, for completing the survey. I think we got, you know, just over, um, just under about 400 people complete the survey, which is uh, excellent. And as you can see um, in looking through the results, I mean, there, I think there's some overwhelming support um, to continue the use, you know, of, um, you know, video conferencing in, in, in certain fashions. I think um, there's, there's less of a uh, um, support, you know, for obviously jury trials and you know, maybe complex litigation or evidentiary hearings, but, um, you know, uh, chambers conferences and, you know, civil motion practice and motion hearings, there really seems to be some overwhelming support um, to uh, have the court continue to do that. Uh, and similarly, um, there's really strong support to, you know, continue the, you um, uh, public aspect of that and allowing the public to uh, view uh, those hearings as well. Um, so this is something I think that's really going to help the court, uh, you know, think about, you know, what we're you know, going to do as we move forward. Um, I think Judge McConnell has shared, you know, with, with the bar numerous times that, you know, we're obviously operating under uh, an emergency declaration that allows us to continue to use you know, remote proceedings uh, under the CARES Act for criminal proceedings. Um, and we had issued that uh, temporary interim uh, general order that will allow us on the civil side to continue the use of uh, remote proceedings uh, at um, the judge's discretion. So I think there's definitely some appetite here to, you know, continue the use um, of Zoom proceedings. And I think it's just something collectively um, you know, the court is going to, you know, consider, you know, the continued use of and, you know, perhaps memorialize it, you know, in our in our local rules um, uh, when, um, you know, this new uh, court advisory council kind of gets up, up, up and running. Um, so that was kind of it. If you haven't had an opportunity to look through the results, you know, I, I you know, just suggest that you do. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, pretty, you know, pretty mm -hmm. interesting. And the other kind of piece of this too, and I think this Judge McConnell also may have shared this with the group um, at, at a previous meeting, the, the First Circuit uh, is also uh, really taking this under advisement and, and examining um, the continued use of um, Zoom uh, for all the courts in the circuit. So this is something that, um, you know, will really kind of help us and help the circuit and all the courts in the circuit to really, um, you know, put, put something together that I think is um, you know, beneficial not only for the court and the bar, but also gives, I think, um, you know, really good public access um, you know, to the public as well. Thanks, Frank, and thanks to everyone who responded. Let me open it up. Are there any questions or comments on Zoom and the like? Yeah, actually, I'm curious. Do uh, do the judges have a general preference, or the, does the court have a general preference for holding things uh, remotely? I mean, I, I miss going into court um, and into chambers. You know, be, being in the building, um, and I'm just wondering if it's the type of thing where the for the most part, do the do the judges would they prefer to have proceedings held remotely? I think, Mike, we are um, we are um, along a continuum. Uh, each judge, um, I, I'll speak for myself. I I probably liked Zoom and continue to like Zoom more than most, um, and um, try to use it wherever it's um, most effective and and where we're still allowed to do it, um, and. Um, other judges, I, I'm, I can see Judge Sullivan and McElroy around here, they can comment specifically. I know Judge Smith is probably at the other extreme um, and likes to use it least, at least of us, I would, I, I think. Um, and I think everyone else is kind of somewhere in between right now. What, we, what we're trying to figure out is going forward, is there, other than, you know, the whim of the judge at any given moment, is there a way to classify what gets done in certain ways. I mean, I think we're all clear that rule 16s will always be done now by Zoom, that most chambers conferences will be done by Zoom. I think everyone kind of thinks that, but beyond that, like the average civil motion um, hearings, criminal is a whole different ball game because rule 53 um, uh, prohibits it in most instances. 
Um, so I think I think you're going to see each judge doing it um, differently. And what we haven't figured out yet, just logistically, is how we get the bar's input on it without it overwhelming us. So there'll be some default. Uh, at some point where certain things will default to either in person or live and hopefully we'll have some input for the attorneys to be able to say can we do um can we do it otherwise whichever whichever it is but um that's being worked on and hopefully it'll be worked on with the advice and consent of of the bar okay. i can give my two cents for what it's worth um which is that i think that it that Zoom provides some things for us that we didn't have before. Um, for lawyers, I think you don't have to come to court for a 15 minute discussion or a brief motion or you know a trial calendar call where you're gonna say, I need a month or I'm ready. Um, it takes away definitely, I don't know who said that they missed coming to court, definitely takes away some of that. I think that that has to be balanced with the needs of individual attorneys and clients. Um, you know, for those of you who've looked at the issue, um, litigation drives women in particular out of the practice of law. And some of that is the um, demands of travel and of in-court time when, whether you like to hear it or not, guys, um, we typically do most of the child care and housework, regardless of how evenly divided um, the careers are. So I think that we need to balance all of that. That said, there are some things that I've kind of defaulted now to criminal pleas and sentencings in person, um, unless somebody wants to do it remotely, and then I will, um, as long as we have the authority. In civil cases, if there are witnesses, so if it's an evidentiary motion or um, something like that, I would do it in person. Otherwise I default basically to remote. But if you can agree with others to, um, with the other parties, you know, the other side to come in in person and we feel as a court that it's safe and you're willing to do the things you need to do to come into court. That's the other part of it. You need to be masked. And if you're gonna take your mask off at the podium, are we still testing, Jack, Judge? Yes. yes. You need to be tested. So I've had people, not in civil cases, but say, oh, I don't wanna, um, I wanna take my mask off, but I don't wanna be tested and I'm not vaccinated. Well, you know, you're not um, uh, gonna take your mask off. So um, so it's we are still trying to keep everybody as safe as we can, but also recognizing that going forward for um, people, some, ability to do remote access, I think is important. I think even more important than remote hearings is frankly, and I'm, I know, you know, um, I don't, Judge McConnell doesn't have complete control over this, but I think court hearings should be continue to be available on Zoom. The, I don't see any reason why a, a plaintiff or a defendant in a civil case can't be there for the motion um, because they have to work or, you know, things like that we typically don't have um, parties there. I think people should be able to watch court. They should be able to watch their cases. They should be able to watch everybody else's cases. And I feel fairly strongly about that. Um, I feel if you don't want people watching what's going on in court, perhaps you're doing things you shouldn't be doing in court or you're speaking in a way you shouldn't be speaking or whatever. It encourages witnesses to be honest. It encourages people to be courteous. And it gives us um, uh, the benefit of having a more educated um, populace about what we do. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Judge. Um, George Sullivan, I don't know, are you on? And do you have any comments? Uh, sorry, this is Pat, Judge Sullivan's clerk. Um, we've got a matter going on and she had to leave. Okay, thanks, Pat. Um, okay, any other comments on? The future of Zoom. All right, well, stay tuned. Uh, next on our agenda is operations update. And this is something we have not seen in recent meetings. Why so many trials? And Nora, I'm not, who's, who would like to address this? Uh, Mike Simon Sully's on and he's got some 
great um, graphs, of course, that he put together. Okay, great. <laughs> share his screen. I mean, this is this is of course a longtime favorite. I know the Federal Bench Bar <laughs> Committee is fun with charts and graphs. I can see everyone's excitement already. So uh, here we go. So first, I just want to make sure that everyone can see my exciting little chart over here on the left. And uh, just nod appropriately. Yes, you can see it. <laughs> okay. Um, so we were talking about things that are in court and things that are not. Well, um, we have seen a kind of flurry of, of in court activity, um, particularly over the last sort of six months. As you can see from my fun little graph here, we have a nice little uptick here in both jury and non jury trials. And this um, kind of even belies kind of the activity um, somewhat that we've seen recently. Um, we've had as you can see, um, six jury trials and uh, four non-jury trials. And most of this activity has actually come since the, um, the beginning of the summer um, through uh, this month. And this doesn't even kind of tell the whole story. Um, we've had two criminal cases that sort of settled on the day of um, the impanelment. So we actually had juries in the building for that. We had a number of civil cases that went to the kind of last minute and um, settled right before we um, went to trial. And in addition to that, I see that there's a bunch of trials that are actually scheduled for um, the new year. So if you kind of maybe run this from 12 months, you know, starting this summer to next summer, I think it's even going to be more dramatic. So when Nora told me that this was a question that people had, um, she's like, you know, do you know why? And I'm like, well, I don't know. So I so I tested a bunch of theories out, and some of them <laughs> turned out to be totally not true. Um, so the first thing I was like, well, maybe people aren't filing dispositive motions as much as they uh, were in the past. And that is not true. Um, they're, they're coming in at the same rates. They're generally being um, granted or denied at the same rates as before. So that wasn't really sort of generating it. And then I was like, maybe it's something really obvious that we had a global pandemic and, you know, and things really didn't break down. And, you know, so we maybe had some delays. And so when I looked at the civil cases, particularly, as you can see my sort of chart here, we had kind of an uptick in civil cases in 2018 and 2019. Obviously in 2020, some, some stuff happened and that kind of threw a few uh, wrenches in the works. And I think that what we're kind of seeing maybe in terms of trial activity is this kind of larger number of civil cases kind of basically working their way sort of through um, their, you know, they've obviously during the pandemic, we were probably a bit more judicious in terms of our extensions of times of deadlines. Obviously people had trouble, you know, with discovery or deposing people because of people were remote and people were concerned obviously about viruses and, you know, totally, totally understand that. So that I think was part of it. And then, and then I got a kind of sort of thinking back to over time, um, you know, one thing this court is obviously, you know, we only have three authorized judgeships. And in the course of the time that I've worked here, we've had significant amounts of time where one of those judgeships was not filled. Um, so we have had this kind of accordion effect where we, you know, we have only two judges and all the cases go to them. We get a third judge and it sort of expands and that kind of expansion and contraction happens. And I went and looked actually um, when Judge McConnell joined the court and we had kind of a similar effect um, where we had in the previous couple of years before he joined, we had fewer trials. And then when he came on, it seemed to be that kind of opened things up a little bit and that led to some more trial activity. Um, so I, I think that that is maybe some of what's driving it. Um, I mean, one thing that I did sort of notice too here, I have another um, another sort of fun chart. Um, and so this here is kind of showing, I think again, what it's sort of cresting. So this is the, um, the number of cases that are somewhat trial eligible, I'm calling it. So I removed things like social security cases and prisoner habeas petitions that wouldn't go to trial. And as you can see, this is the number of pending cases that would be pending at the end of the year. And as you can see, it seems like it's sort of crested in 2020 and we're kind of going on a downslope now. So again, I think we're kind of catching all of these cases. They're kind of all meeting at this kind of one time and are becoming sort of trial eligible. And I had a sort of another sort of chart here where the, um, I, I was looking at the amount of time that cases are pending. And I've noticed too that um, into this year, the, the amount of time that a case has been pending, the median 
is about double of what it was um, five years ago. So again, I think it was just, we had a lot of cases at one time, they pended for a longer period of time, and now the kind of system is, is sort of expelling them out at the end. Um, so I think it's a number of factors, but of course we were interested in hearing from the bar their own kind of specific experiences about what they think may be driving this. I mean, that's what I can tell on kind of a global level from just looking at the, the broad-based statistics that, that we have. Thanks, Mike, very informative. And I'll open it up to anyone who wants to respond to Mike's questions. And hearing none, we'll leave it as an open question. No, thanks, Mike, we, we do enjoy the charts. Um, next on the agenda is, um, there's been an announcement about a new advisory council. So I'll turn it over to Judge McConnell. Um, sure, I'm not sure there's much more to add. I, I forecasted to many people that this was coming. I think I sent a draft before the judges um, approved it to um, leaders of the bar, all of which I think you were on it and got some great feedback on it and we tinkered it accordingly. And I think Frank, it went out a couple of days ago where we're now soliciting uh, members to um, to to uh, to join it. We hope, I think, to have that wrapped up sometime in December um, and um, get it up and running. It was um, largely it was to formalize um, the bar's input into the operations of of the court and to have a set in place way for the court to. Um, hear strategically from the bar on issues that, that uh, affect them big and small, and also to coordinate the various number of committees that are kind of intermingled, but all operated separately before this, the local rules committee, the, the bench bar committee, the um, uh, district conference committee, the CLE committee, we used to have a bar, co a bar admission committee um, uh, and, and whatnot so that, um, uh, over oversight of the the bar fund, um, and so that would all be in a coordinated sense with a group of people who um, will be in charge of all of those things and um, and represent the bar. So um, I hope you all are considering joining. Uh, you're the folks that have been the most involved in helping us um, to this. Right, and, Can you hear me uh, now? Hello. Hello. Um, anyway, um, I think it's out there. If you haven't received it, let Frank know that there's a glitch in the system, but I don't think so. And we're starting to get, um, it's not a, a real application form. It's really just your name, rank, and serial number. Um, uh, uh, we'd really appreciate it if people would consider giving of their time um, for it, because it'll only work if we have people that regularly litigate in the federal courts um, and can give good input about how the operations affect their practice. Thanks, Judge. Any questions on the council? Neville, did you want to make a comment? I guess we're all set. All right, well, that brings us to the end of our agenda. Um, I'll open it up if there are any other items folks want to address. Pat, this is Dana Horton. Um, Hi, Dana. I if you don't mind, I would just like to um, give a plug for the Bar Association's annual meeting, which will be held next year on June 1st and 2nd. So the deadline to submit proposals has passed. It was November 9th. However, uh, if you've got a good idea or a topic that you want to present on, I'm sure it's not too late. Um, we can get you that form if you need it. The Bar Association has it. I have it. I think Pat has it as well. Um, so if, if it's not too late, if you uh, have a good idea or a hot topic you want to present on, get in touch with one of us and we'd be happy to facilitate submitting that form for you. Okay, Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dana. And uh, Lynette? Uh, yeah, on this court advisory council, on, uh, what, how many attorneys are you thinking will be on the advisory council and will they all serve on the um, subcommittees? Um. We we've, we've batted around the idea of like 15 to 20, trying to make it representative enough, but not too big that it becomes unmanageable. 
Um, um, Nora just texted me and told me we've already have 45 applications for it. So I don't know if that kind of interest will have us increase it or not increase it. But I think the idea, um, and Nora and Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, was that these 15 to 20 people would serve on the council that would meet regularly, you know, and 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 you'd be expected to show up. Um, you know, I mean, there's going to it's it's a it's a two way street. We need we want your involvement, but um, once once we accept it, we need um, we need some regularity for the council to make any sense. Um, and I think the idea was to add people to the subcommittees that weren't otherwise on the council. If that was your question, Lynette. Um, yeah, because, you know, I mean, like the district conference committee took up, I don't know what, 15 people, Josh, or something like that, 15, 20 people. Um, so I think the chairs would come from the council and then um, populate it accordingly. I think that's, Frank and Norik, just kick me if I'm wrong. Yep, no, I think that's the idea of it, Josh. Okay, any other questions, comments? All right, well, seeing and hearing none. Um, I hope everyone in the family has a terrific Thanksgiving. And we will see you at the next meeting. You too, Pat. Thanks. Thank okay, you. thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Pat.